you are live good to go okay uh good morning good afternoon and good evening to one and all who have joined us from different parts of the world uh greetings from the yellow ribbon and hcg hospital bangalore india i am dr suresh from bangalore india welcoming you all for this one of a kind webinar entitled global perspective okay. of tinosuma in treating giant cell tumor of the bone uh, before we start we hope you're all keeping safe from the pandemic that the world is facing today our wishes and regards to everyone who is fighting covid 19 hoping that we'll pass through this phase together safely uh, so it's delighting to see so many participants of uh, and viewers from different parts of the world we were told that around 25 plus uh, countries have uh, joined us today so it's a pleasure having you all so uh, before we start briefly uh, why this webinar uh, like the speakers were discussing just before the event started dinosumab in giant cell tumor is a very hot topic in the present day scenario I was first introduced to dinosumab by my boss Dr Pramod during my early days in orthopedic oncology. It was initially termed as the wonder drug for giant cell tumor of the bone. It was termed as the golden bullet and it was given all sorts of names and it actually lived up to the expectations of many in terms of disease control. But slowly uh, we realized that even though the dinosumab gives excellent tumor response unlike any other ther- chemotherapeutic agent which is known uh, we I started asking ourselves is that what we really need we started to question about how and when this drug has to be used though dinosumab was approved in 2013 the practice of using dinosumab has considerably changed uh, in the past 7 or 8 years to a large extent we have learned and continue to learn its clinical implications and yet there are so many questions which are unanswered the indications the duration of therapy the end point when do you want to go with the surgery it's used as an adjuvant it's used as a monotherapy and many other questions are still a matter of debate so we basically wanted to have a global perspective with the use of dinosumab in giant cell tumor of the bone from different geographic areas and we invited experts to share their experience with an intent of having a clearer picture of using dinosumab in the present day scenario so uh, without Uh, delay i'll introduce the speakers which we have today uh, dr k c wong from the prince of wales hospital the chinese university of hong kong hong kong china dr constantino erani from the instituto ortopedico rizzoli bologna italy dr manish agarwal from induja hospital mumbai india and dr pramod chinda from the yellow ribbon and hcg hospital bangalore india i'll be briefly introducing the speakers when as and when they speak So without uh, further ado let me introduce to our first speaker Dr K C Wong most of us know him for his contribution to the field of navigation computer assisted tumor surgeries and 3d printed implants he's been one of the founders and world opinion leaders in computer assisted tumor surgery and has organized multiple international workshop on cats apart from numerous articles and chapters apart from computer assisted surgeries and advanced prosthetic limb reconstruction dr wong's area of interest and expertise involved the basic research medical treatment and minimally invasive surgeries for giant cell tumor his department has conducted multiple studies on tumorigenesis biological behavior cytokine and chemokine regulation and the use of adjuvants on gct dr wong over to you so i'm i'm K- i'm kc so so uh, i'd like to share uh, the talk as a first speaker so so uh, first of all i need to uh, thank so for the organizing committee to remind me to to share uh, to talk on this topic So uh, my my turn is basically to to share with you uh, our current understanding the pathogenesis of uh, what's mean by giant cell tumor bone uh, based on our previous preclinical study and some of our clinical studies. So I will spend more time on the pathogenesis on the part, especially on the somita part, and also the dinosumab. And later on, for I think for for more the clinical scenario and also uh, uh, the case uh, illustration, I will leave uh, to the other speaker to share with you. So I don't have any disclosure for that. So basically, I I will talk about most of the time is a a, a GCT model, powerful physiology, 
and I spent a little bit more time on the serum cell because it actually is the neoplastic part of the tumors. And also uh, I discussed then what should be the medical treatment strategy on, on these tumors. I will show because of uh, all our understanding on this uh, uh, med uh, medical treatment on this uh, giant cell tumor bone, I will illustrate uh, what uh, we usually do uh, uh, for giant cell tumor bone at, uh, in our UN unit and make uh, some consensus arising from this. So basically, giant cell tumor bone is uh, quite common in, in Asian population as compared with Western countries. So from uh, one of the study, uh, I think it's back a series from, from China, from Professor News, the Jishitan Hospital. Actually, they, they are think that it's 20% of the primary bone tumor is uh, treating a giant cell tumor bone. So this is uh, the most uh, 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 important slide for uh, giant cell tumor bone. So there's uh, three types of cells, monoleucous stromal cell, monocyte and also multi giant cell. So this picture actually is a, a favorite uh, exit uh, fellowship exam question for our, our orthopedic surgeon as well. So for, for this, uh, uh, basically, um, how is the interaction for these three types of cells? So as I mentioned that the stromal cell is a leoplastic part, basically they will secrete uh, uh, some cytokine that will attract the monocyte in the bloodstream to the area of, uh, of the stromal cell. With an overexpression of this ranked ligand, they will overactivate it and also have a formation of a multi giant cell. So to make it a more simple or, or of a more uh, um, uh, easy to remember, I'll treat this as a big boss of, the, of these tumors. And all, the, all these minions will join together to make the, uh, at the end of the uh, destruction of the bone lighters. So I'll go through one by one for what, what's, what we know about these stromal cells. In order to have a, a good understanding of this, uh, we have a, we need to know what, what's the origin of these cells. So you see really the leoplastic uh, uh, cells. There's some study showing that there's some chromosomal instabilities, some mutated P53 uh, genes, tumor suppression gene. And now this we have, uh, for our case, we routinely do this uh, uh, genetic uh, mutation, X3, F3 uh, gene mutation with uh, immunochemical staining G4 for, for, uh, as a diagnostic test for uh, uh, giant cell tumor bones. But the problem is that uh, there's uh, not a consistent of genetic structural abnormalities for all these stromal cells. And some, some will postulate that what is it is a leoplism, it's a, actually it's a reactive condition. And also, we don't have an animal model because we, we have an in, inability to uh, uh, use these stromal cells to form cones in vitro to form an animal model. So we are difficult to test our drugs at, at the moment. So I think this is uh, in the past 15 years or 20 years, this is a, quite an important understanding of what's actually is what's these uh, stromal cells. From this uh, picture, you see that actually the stromal cell is quite similar to the mesenchymal uh, stem cell. And all this uh, stromal cell, as some of our, our, from our unit, we tested, actually express uh, markers of uh, mesenchymal stem cell and also early osteoblast lineage. So we will consider that as uh, some sort of pre osteoblast some immature osteoblast because of some, some unknown mechanism, they are arrested at this stage, at this stage in, instead of uh, uh, developing in the mature osteoblast. And why they will happen at the end, they may be uh, activated by some local trauma or, or, or with hemorrhage, they will uh, activate this kind of uh, arrest of uh, uh, differentiation of this instead of uh, some uh, pre-existing uh, genetic change. So for this, it got a metastasis, but on the cell itself, we don't have any malignant cytophysic features. So uh, one of the two, there's two papers showing that uh, from the observations that this primary metastasis, although the three percent, is rarely, di rarely discovered at the initial diagnosis, and more happened uh, after local recurrence. So it come to the uh, postulation that whether this uh, actually is a tumor embolizing area of a hemorrhage and thrombus uh, formation during the initial and traditional surgery or, or, or resection during the time of surgeries. So for this stromal cell from the uh, molecular aspect, actually it's the overexpress of this ligand. All this uh, we are talking about of the nosomab is this rank, rank ligand. So this is very important to drive to the mon monocyte to undergo fusion to form a multi decay osteoclast a giant cell. And this all will make up of all this bone destruction. And then in the molecular level, we, we find that actually there's some promoter of this rank ligand, they are upregulated. So because of these uh, stromal cells, they 
uh, upregulated with uh, the promoter of rank lichen, they over express this rank lichen, they attract more of the monocyte to the uh, site of, of the bone of the lesion itself and forming more uh, multi-decade giant cell and all causing all these bone destructions. So I think for, for the strategy of, of, of the strategy of, uh, of the aim of the treatment of the giant cell tumor, I think the for medical treatment is still the same as the surgery. We still want to reduce the local recurrence because it's a benign lesion, we want to preserve the functions. But how's the medical expert on, on this? I think for a logical uh, 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 postulation that I think we, we need to tackle for the big boss, the leopastic stromal cells, either you kill the stromal cell or because as I mentioned, that is a, some sort of p also blast or me mature also blast. They are rest in their normal differentiation. Whether we can promote them to be a, a become a normal osseo or osseo blast. So the other 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 aspect we can do is against the effector cells, the the multi-lipid giant cell, either cytotoxic. Uh, or kill the osteocast or inhibit its formation. So for or for the approach wise, I think uh, both of them is possible. So, and then it's now what kind of a medication or a lot of this we are using for this. We have been doing uh, using this response for, for quite some year, I think more than 15 years based on the previous, uh, our uh, basic uh, preclinical studies. So for so in general exit, basically they, they exhibit anti cancer effect on other cancer cells, myeloma, carcinoma, osteosarcomas, in mutual studies. They can attack the stromal cell, inhibit angiogenesis, inhibit uh, the cell proliferation, induction of apoptosis, um, decrease the tumor adhesion of this. So they, they actually have uh, exhibit an uh, anti-tumor effect beside a, a cancer cell. So whether it actually uh, uh, we do the same for, for the stromal cell or giant cell tumors, in our basic study, basically they, they also exhibit similar anti-tumor effect on the stromal cells. And but that the, the drugs we use for bisphosphonate is uh, solingenic acid because it's the most potent bisphosphonate. Instead of uh, the initial, we at uh, the, in the initial phase of our studies, we use a parmigenate. That's a, a much less uh, potent than this than this uh, solingenic acid. And then uh, this KM, uh, this solingenic acid basically for the anti tumor effect, basically is uh, inhibit some uh, 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 key enzyme that's uh, important for uh, the melanoic uh, uh, pathway. This is very important for protein penetration. That's important for many cellular uh, interaction and the function uh, in our normal cells. So they got an anti-tumor effect for this. So the map says that the main topic of, the, of, the, of this seminar, uh, this webinar is uh, the map. Basically, as I mentioned, there's overexpressed this rank lichen, and these uh, monolithic antibody drugs basically specifically inhibit this rank lichen. With this, uh, without this rank lichen, basically the the osteocast cannot survive. And then I, the next slide, I will show you uh, what what happened to the two drugs on 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 these uh, effector cells. And then the map in the past, we are treating osteoporosis, primary, secondary, and then um, I think this this. This slide actually summarizes uh, our uh, understanding of what kind of this, what this uh, bisphosphonate or, or denosumab, how it acts on these effector cells. So for denosumab, they are very, they are very specific. They block all the rank lichen. So without rank lichen, they actually this uh, osteocast uh, monocyte cannot be fused to become a multi liquid giant cells. So without this uh, fusion of this, the these cells probably will die within a few weeks time. And then before is is less potent than than the denosumab, but it is absorbed uh, within the um, osteocast. At the same time, they bind to the bone mineral of the bone. So for for denosumab, they have no uh, binding of, of the bone. So it's just uh, within the uh, treating the effect cells. But the fibrosomal beside uh, acting on the bone, they they are binding to the uh, bone resorption site uh, where the osteocast can exert. So for, um, for our understanding that uh, uh, the denosome is very potent on these effector cells. They are very, they, they just lock up all the osteocastic activity. But because of they are not binding to the bone, they have a shorter effect. But for the bisphosphonate, because um, uh, they have a less, in, instead of uh, uh, killing off, lock off all the uh, osteocastic activity, basically they just uh, disable the osteocast. 
And then um, because of binding of the mineral part of the bone, they stop the resorption of the of the bone at the, at the osteocastic site. So they may have a longer e effect on this. So whether we can, this, this uh, 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 understanding of the, these two drugs on the normal bone mechanism, uh, whether it translates into uh, our clinical, I will just speak uh, after that. So just take this case for uh, Sonogen X in a 16 years old girl with uh, a GCT of bone. So after one dose of the uh, 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 sometimes for this, basically most of the uh, osteocast like a uh, giant cell actually disappear. And then there's uh, some necrosis we observe. And because of this necrosis, this inflammatory cell, this is uh, try to healing or try to heal of, of the healing of the part of the necrosis. And there's some, some fibroblast or healing phase. So you, you see that uh, this is a very specific for the stromal cell uh, of a giant cell tumor bone. And then after, because of, the, of this uh, syndrome exit, after killing bone, actually there's uh, the stromal cell, some of them actually kill. We, we can't observe for this. And this, as compared with the nosomab, I, I think everyone will know that. So for Sonogen exit, the, because of the, the inhibition of the of the osteocastic activity is less compared with uh, uh, the, the nosomab. So the tumor itself is still quite uh, a brownish fiber and they're quite easy to to observe to to see to to see where actually the tumor is and also uh, easy to carry touch out. And then this slide actually summarizes what our understanding in the basic preclinical study and also clinical study on, on the histology, how this sonogenic exit on the germ cells. So as far as we understand from our previous study and also from other, other researchers, so definitely sonogenic exit got an anti-tumor effect on the germ cell. In terms of the dose-dependent manner, decrease the cell proliferation of germ cell, in one of the one of the uh, uh, mechanisms is in due apoptosis. At the same time, it will decrease also class. We haven't uh, done any uh, of the uh, whether you promote differentiation or not. So for clinical studies, actually it concur what we we understand from the key preclinical studies. So they decrease stromal cell with fibroblastic changes, have cell necrosis, decrease also class, have a fibro fibroblastic changes and also calcification. But whether this increased bone formation. It means that we actually promote the differentiation. We are not pretty sure at, 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 at the meantime. So this is a meta analysis from uh, one of the uh, research, a uh, surgeon from one of the center from one of the uh, center in China. Basically, summarize uh, all the uh, studies for the uh, uh, sonogenic acid on the treatment of a uh, of a giant cell tumor of bone. We we did uh, the first uh, clinical case control study in two thousand and eight. So the conclusion from this meta-analysis is that uh, the bisphosphonate actually can reduce uh, local recurrence in giant cell tumor bone for uh, after the intra-lesional kidney touch at an early follow-up. This is a mid-term follow-up, I think it's around five to six. We are, we are, we are, we are undergoing our, 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 our uh, review of data, whether the long-term uh, follow-up for with, treated with bisphosphonate actually can, can show the same result or not. Probably we will present it uh, sometime later for this. So this is one of our patients uh, quite some years ago, 15 years ago, after the stage three uh, GCT with uh, a PO, uh, one or two dose of showmeters, we do we did a, a clear touch. And then you see that a quite this is a quite a very good uh, consolidation and sharing of, of tumor. So um, now the patient is still still okay, no recurrence. And then uh, uh, although there's some degen early degenerative of the knee, it's, it's, it's the tumor is, is okay. So the distal radius, um, after the, uh, uh, similar treatment of somitis, two years later, got a recurrence at the proximal part. So we did another course of a uh, somitis and also uh, in later on we, we did. One of our feeling is uh, saying that um, we are not pretty sure whether because of the binding of the uh, uh, bisphosphonate at the bone uh, uh, mineral part, whether it actually the drug can exert an effect in the long, long run whether we could delay or actually decrease aggressiveness of local recurrence, we are not really sure. We need the more data to support this. Long-term result of the showmeter, we need to look at for this. So I, I think another paper I want to show uh, share with you is this uh, important papers. At the time, I think 2012, at that time, the uh, uh, also map actually is a very hot topic uh, with a, a few uh, phase two trial at that time. But uh, in our preclinical studies, we found uh, a finding that actually is not as good as we, we think for the denosumab. We find that 
denosumab in the preclinical study on the stromal cell, basically there's no anti-tumor effect. In contrast with the solingenic acid, they've got a dose-dependent uh, anti-tumor effect as uh, in, in the past we showed in our basic studies. So at that time, we already have a, 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 a suspected that, or so a, a, a very good uh, a concern that whether it's after the stopping of drug, whether the local recurrence will, uh, will come, the tumor will go back because Actually, they said they are not tackling for, for the stromal cell itself. So this is uh, the case of uh, uh, giant cell tumor bone with distal radius. So uh, after the nosomab for those be, be, before, there's a lot of uh, 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 calcification uh, consolidation on this. On this uh, uh, histology, a lot of multi-decay giant cell, monodecay cell, but after that, uh, mono all the osteoclasts lock off. There's no more osteoclasts. Monolithic cells still remain, and also is surrounded by a uh, fibrous tissue around. And also there's an osteoid deposition around all these stromal cells. As you can see that from this uh, uh, G34 uh, uh, W staining for particular for the stromal cell, they are closely packed before the denosomab, the, the biopsy uh, specimen. But after that, you see that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, spacing, uh, uh, well, the separated between those, all the stromal cell. And all this space actually surrounded by fibrous tissue. And it actually concurs with uh, what our, uh, our feeling when we, when we do a, a curatage. They are whitish, difficult to identify, just like a scar. And also it's very uh, firm. It's really difficult to curatage out. So if the district cannot uh, uh, decrease the local recurrence, and basically add uh, more difficulty for our intralesional uh, carrier touch. We are quite uh, uh, so a lot of concern about, about this. So this last summarize what we're understanding for the preclinical study on denosomab. So preclinical study, stromal cell, there's no anti-tumor effect on denosomab. We haven't, uh, there also there's no promotion of a uh, uh, differentiation of this stromal cell into a normal osteoblast uh, lineage. So this historic, as I described in the last cases, that um, they uh, uh, decrease a lot of osteoclast, fibrosis, calcification, a lot of movement bone around. So one of the, uh, um, what's the origin of this bone formation? Uh, we are still not pretty sure whether this uh, indirectly, because of the lock off of uh, osteoclastic activity, so that uh, it can promote a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, promotion of this stromal cell in the real life or in a, uh, in, uh, in a clinical uh, start in setting. So we are pretty not, not sure whether it actually represent the normal uh, bone remodeling of this bone. We, we, are not, we, we are not pretty sure at the moment. So the last part of uh, uh, our understanding of this uh, denosomab is uh, I want to talk about the angiogenesis. So there's a uh, two studies, one we, we work with uh, Gisner Hospital that uh, we be with our cases and then uh, use uh, the CT to see the enhancement of the, of the tumor, whether the enhancement of decrease or not, and actually it decreased the blood loss. And they also did a, a, a we call it micro vessel density on the historic slide. And there's a special staining for, for the epithelial markers. So that vascular endothelial markers that um, actually it can decrease the micro vessel density. I think it's logical because uh, all the osteoclastic activity locked down and then it, the blood supply should be decreased a bit. It, it, it hopefully will decrease a, a bit of bus, uh, blood loss during the uh, uh, surgery, especially for the pelvic and sac sacral uh, GCT. So other indication, I think uh, for, for those are unresectable uh, cases uh, as shown in this paper that uh, I think it's a good uh, uh, control of the, of, of the tumors. Once it lock off uh, of the osteoclastic activity, actually the, the tumor clinically is very quiescent. Whether we can treat this kind of uh, unresectable tumor as a chronic disease with decreased dose intensity schedule of the denosomab, we need a more consensus of this. Lung metastasis, we will also do, uh, because if it is not resectable, we are uh, using this drug to this, uh, treat uh, all these uh, lung metastasis. So after dropping the drugs, so uh, three months, very good response. After dropping the drug because of financial problem, so the tumor go back. So this case, it, I just want to illustrate with uh, you that uh, with our understanding of all these preclinical study and also clinical study, what was happened for, for, for case in our team? So let's say for this case, we got a, a ischial uh, giant cell tumor bone. So we given a six month of denosomab, so a very good consolidation of this. 
So basically, uh, all the uh, new bone formation, uh, um, uh, absence of uh, all seal cast, and also the remaining from mononuclear cell. And then sometimes it's really difficult to characterize it as a, this whitish material. And then one of the things we find that uh, after this uh, uh, denosumab, they got a lot of a calcification and also some internal septus. So if you did a, a you do a in traditional curettage, so sometimes you are difficult to read to be sure whether we are pretty good to the bottom of, of these cavities. So in this sense, we will assess from the post treatment CT scan. If there's any internal septus, we will add a, a navigation to help us to make sure that we can curettage. Uh, uh, the, the tumor cavities with uh, reference to uh, our CT findings. So uh, the image just a feedback or the orientation, but in actual sense, we will use uh, a uh, magnified uh, endoscope so that we are actually know what, what actually we are curious touch and uh, what's a reference to our, our curious touch areas. And now it's uh, postoperatively, for all this case, we will give a free dose of somiter because we, we think that dinosomet don't have any anti-tumor effect. And then hopefully with uh, not a, a resection of the tumor as a whole, with a integration clear charge, we will give a free dose of uh, somiter as a, a form of adjuvant therapy to uh, hopefully to have uh, some anti-tumor effect of the remaining serum cell and hopefully to, to uh, decrease the local recurrence in the long run. So lastly, I, I would like to share another uh, our clinic study we in our group. So this study actually, uh, as I mentioned that the, the, uh, the, the tumor got a stromal cell, they have uh, either you kill the stromal cell or, or you promote the defenses of this. Do we can, can find a drugs that can do the both? So from one, one of uh, our, our postulation is that we use this simvastatin. Uh, simvastatin. This actually is uh, anti-cholesterol uh, drugs. It's very common for the, for the hypercholesterolemia. So for, for this uh, statin type of drug, basically in other clinical studies or preclinical study, they can inhibit the cancer growth and also the promote the mesenchymal stem cell to uh, osteoporosis. That's why we, we test it in our, our stromal uh, cell culture cell line to see whether it, it, it can have any effect on this uh, stromal cell in giant cell tumor bone. And then our finding is that uh, they got an anti-tumor effect because they share the same mechanism with the sonogenic exit. And, and at the same time, we show that uh, they can promote the stromal cell with uh, osteogenic differentiation. Some, uh, one of the postulation, they may uh, in, upregulate the, the vitamin D pathway. So some, uh, some of the uh, clinical studies showing that for bone tumors or, or giant cell tumors, they have, may have uh, some vitamin D, D deficiency of this. Whether this drug can, can uh, help in this kind of case with, with collaboration of our, our observational study of uh, vitamin D deficiency, we need more clinical studies to support. So lastly, I, this is what we understanding from our team, from our previous uh, preclinical study and our clinical studies that well, now our regime is like this. For the lonesomeout for unresected giant cell tumor bone, uh, for pelvis or, or spine or sacrum, lung mat, whether we will treat it as a chronic disease with a moderated drug uh, regime. So for some or, or for those kind of a giant cell tumor bone with extensive bone loss, we, we want to plan for a resection, we will go ahead for a new adjuvant uh, 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 denosumab because actually it, it scar up the tumor, conservative tumor, make the resection much easier. For somita, for all other cases of uh, giant cell tumor bone with uh, in traditional touch, we will give uh, upfront and also post-op. In pediatric case, we did definitely give somita. We, we're not giving adenosumab because of rebound hypercalcemia. So the unknown is that all, no matter what kind of denosumab or somita, the effect is not complete. That means that we still need to reset or remove the tumor as a whole, as much as he can. It's only use as an adjuvant treatment. So the problem is that is how to identify and remove this stromal cell. Personally, or in our team, our system, basically make our identification of stromal cell more difficult. So um, for modulated regime, whether we will continue to monitor for bone resorption uh, because of the concern of the long-term side effect of, of the drugs, this is another area we can have a more discussion and also uh, for, for, uh, for, for more research on this. Uh, lastly, I, I would like to acknowledge my, my senior, Professor Kumta. Carol did a lot of uh, research, uh, basic research of this. Uh, Dr. LeCambre is our pathologist, help us to review all these cases. And of course, uh, the members of the orthopedic oncology team here in, in our unit. So that's what I want to share with you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Casey Wong, for the detailed pathophysiology of the JN cell tumor. Uh, you basically uh, touched upon the difference, uh, mechanism of action uh, difference between the zolendronic acid and dinosumab. Uh, truly, zolendronic acid has taken a back seat since the uh, uh, since dinosumab was introduced into the practice. But it is uh, good to know that it is still a viable option to treat patients with uh, giant cell tumor of the bone. So we'll uh, take the questions uh, at the end. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Irani. Uh, he's working as a consultant orthopedic oncologist at the Instituto Orthopedico Rizzoli, Bologna, Italy. His clinical practice includes management of benign and malignant musculoskeletal tumors, and his research involves understanding the molecular biology and the genetic profile of sarcoma and also improving the durability and function of joint replacements. After his training in orthopedic oncology in Rizzoli, he was a fellow at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York for one year. He has a special interest in dinosumab in, uh, in treating giant cell tumor of the bone and has published several papers and given multiple talks on this regard. I've worked with Dr. Arani when I was in uh, Italy and he's one of those who's always considered using dinosumab with a pinch of salt. He has always expressed caution over its usage. His study was one of the first to highlight that there is a possibility of increased local recurrence in patients operated following dinosumab in 2018. He'll be talking about the cautions with the use of dinosumab for treating giant cells tumor of the bone. Dr. Arani, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So, my talk, uh, I think, uh, Uh, is regarding the use uh, of the nosumab for giant cell tumor. And I think this is a very hot topic talk. And you are going uh, to find, find, out, find out why. So how safe and effective is the nosumab for a giant cell tumor of bone? Uh, as you know, uh, recently, several clinical uh, studies in very high impact factor journals have suggested that the nosumab is a new treatment option uh, for patients with giant cell tumor, uh, reporting that uh, the nosumab was associated with uh, tumor response and reduced surgical morbidity. And uh, the nozumab uh, was uh, safe and effective for the treatment of our patients with giant cell tumor of bone. However, uh, our feeling uh, was, uh, was different. We felt that uh, the, the surgery was much more difficult uh, in patients treated with the nozumab because uh, we were not able to recognize the pathological tissue. And so the local occurrence rate was higher in patient treated surgically um, with, uh, with uh, the nosma. And so uh, we retrospectively uh, reviewed the medical records of patients uh, with the giant cell tumor uh, treated uh, in uh, our institute criteria of uh, inclusion were a giant cell tumor of the extremities uh, in patients treated with uh, surgery and or uh, the nosumab uh, with a minimum follow up uh, of two years. Criteria of exclusion were patients with giant cell tumor of the pelvis and uh, the spine. So, uh, we reviewed the medical records of 408 patients. A total of uh, 247 patients underwent uh, curettage and 161 underwent resection. We identified 30 patients uh, treated who had uh, received the nosumab, 25 treated with curettage, and five treated uh, with resection. So the univariate analysis revealed that uh, Campanacci stage three and the nosumab administrations were negative prognostic factors related to local occurrence 
in patients treated with curettage. Uh, in contrast, uh, final adjuvants show that um, significant association with lower risk or low car recurrence. Kaplan Meyer analysis showed a strong association, significant association of the nosumab and uh, local recurrence. And the uh, multivariate analysis that was conducted with a only negative uh, uh, prognostic factor related to local recurrence uh, revealed that the nosumab administration was uh, um, the only independent prognost negative prognostic factor related to local recurrence. So the local recurrence rates in the patients treated with the denosinumab and curettage was 60%. And by contrast, the local recurrence rates in patients treated with the resection and the denosinumab was 0%. So how, um, how was it possible? Um, I did a, a deeply analysis of uh, previous multicentric studies uh, published in high impact factor journals. And I found that uh, in the paper by Thomas, only a small number of patients underwent surgery after the nosoma. As in the investigation by Thomas, Tartla uh, reported patients still on the nosoma treatment and only 25 patients who underwent surgery with a very, very, very short follow-up. But uh, surprising, in the article by Rutowski, the median time of local recurrence was higher than the median time of follow-up. So this was very, very surprising, you know, for a paper published in a high impact factor journal. The only um, paper with a long follow-up was the paper by Trau uh, that reported that the Nozumab does not improve the local control uh, in patients with giant cell tumor. And the authors reported that uh, the surgery is much more difficult after the Nozumab treatment because the new bone that developed following the Nozumab treatment can hide the tumor cells. And so with this could increase the risk of local recurrence. And uh, this is a, um, a typical example of what can happen. After the nozzle, you can have a new bone formation that hides the tumor cells. And then after curettage, when you stop the administration of the nozzle, you have a local recurrence. So our results are published in JBJS America. So if you want, you can check deeply our data. And uh, we uh, made a, also a systematic review uh, showing uh, that uh, um, patients uh, treated with uh, uh, that uh, the nosumab does not uh, improve the local control of patients treated uh, with curettage. So the second question is uh, how safe is the nosumab for giant cell tumor of bone? Um, we report a case of uh, a giant cell tumor in um, uh, a young uh, woman. Uh, this woman underwent curettage of the left ischium in 2005, picking the bone cavity with bone cement. The diagnosis was giant cell tumor. We didn't find uh, uh, USP6 gene arrangement. Uh, we didn't find MDM2 gene amplifications. Uh, 10 years after the first surgery, uh, the patient had a local recurrence. So we made a, a biopsy under CT, and the diagnosis was again giant cell tumor with H3, F3A mutation, no USP6 G arrangement, no MDM2 gene amplification. So because, uh, you know, previous uh, papers reported that uh, the nosumab was safe and effective, and because of the location of the disease, we 
uh, started to use uh, nosumab in these patients and the pain uh, disappeared and the CT showed the sclerosis around the lesion. However, at six months, uh, the patient started to have pain again and CT uh, showed a growing mass. So uh, I made uh, an infusional biopsy and the diagnosis was uh, high uh, grade uh, osteosarcoma. Unfortunately, uh, the patient received chemotherapy but dying during uh, the, the treatment secondary to uh, lung meds. So our case report is published in uh, JJCO. So if you want, you can check deeply our data. So again, how was it possible? I found that uh, uh, previous papers reported possible cases of malignant transformation of giant cell tumor under the nosomal treatment. But this patient condition was considered by authors unrelated to the nosomal treatment. And investigators believe that the diagnosis of primary malignant giant cell tumor was missed by sampling error at the time of the initial core biopsy. And so in the paper, uh, Thomas uh, showed clinical benefit, but uh, two patients of the 37 developed malignant transformation. And this patient condition was considered by authors unrelated to the, to the nosma treatment. Kafka um, uh, reported three patients who had a new primary uh, malignancy, uh, two had sarcomas, and one had a thyroid cancer with a high-grade sarcoma inside a lesion. Rutowski uh, reported two patients uh, who developed malignant transformations under the nosma treatment, but the investigators believe that uh, uh, the diagnosis of primary malignant giant cell tumor was missed by simply error at the time of the initial core biopsy. Um, Aponte Etinao um, described a 20 years old woman with a man with a recurrent uh, giant cell tumor who developed a bone sarcoma while receiving the nosomap treatment. And the recurrent giant cell tumor responded to the nosomap until malignant transformation occurred, as in our case. And Brown et al. reported two cases of sarcoma to transformation of giant cell tumor to sarcoma in patient receiving the nosma. At both, giant cell tumors responded to the nosma until malignant transformation occurred. And Chan and Pu recently performed a meta analysis showing that a new primary malignancy occurred significantly more frequently in patients with metastatic bone disease treated with denosumab than with zolendronic acid. So uh, we know that the treatment effects of denosumab can be attributed to its actions against the ligand of rank. So denosumab means to rank and reducing or eliminating osteoclast-like giant cells. But we know that the receptor rank is not only in the membrane surface of osteoclast, but also in the membrane surface of B and T cells. So the expression of rank plays an important role in B and T cell differentiations. And its inhibition could eventually increase the risk of infection or new malignancy due to, to immunosuppression. So um, the scientific community should be aware of possible association of uh, malignant, uh, between malignant transformation and denosumab therapy and use denosumab with extreme caution because giant cell tumor is a benign tumor and commonly occurs in young adults who have a long life expectancy. But never say never. So. Uh, like any surgeon, I always think I'm the best. And uh, recently, I performed a, a curettage of this difficult case 
of giant cell tumor of the pelvis using embolization before the surgery and cryotherapy during the surgery at, uh, at uh, the first uh, follow-up after six months. The patient was fine without local recurrence. And I saw that uh, I was uh, the best surgeon in the world, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, after one year, the patient had a huge, huge, huge local recurrence. And we decided to treat the patient with the Nozomac bef before uh, the surgery. And uh, uh, during a short term preoperative the Nozomac treatment, the pain disappeared and CT showed a very good response. We felt that the short therapy um, was enough for giant cell tumor and a great research fellow Surai published recently uh, with um, uh, his boss, uh, Pramod Chinder, that, you know, the short term therapy has the same effect of long uh, therapy. So you can reduce not only uh, the complication, but also the cost. So we use the short term uh, therapy and then I made a resection and the reconstruction uh, of, the, of the pelvis with bone, uh, uh, massive bone allograft. So never say never. And uh, I would like to thank uh, my friends around the world uh, who work with me um, on this project. Uh, it was not easy to publish against the Nozomab five years ago, you know. Um, and uh, so I needed the support of my friend around the world, around the world from India, from uh, Japan, from, uh, from, um, from Greece. And, um, you know, I would like to thank all uh, foreign Rizoli fellows uh, because they are the future of our scientific community, small scientific community, the community of uh, musculoskeletal oncology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arani, for the talk. So basically, uh, with respect to the cautions with Dinosumab, Dr. Arani highlighted on the local recurrence and also the possibility of malignant uh, transformation. Uh, well, uh, at the present day, uh, it's local recurrence with the use of Dinosumab is uh, well proven beyond doubt. And uh, regarding the malignant transformation with Dinosumab, if it's a complication or a consequence, it's, it's still not known. It's still a matter of debate. So we will talk more about it uh, in the end uh, when, we, when we discuss about all the topics. Uh, the viewers, if you have any questions, you can comment on the, you can type your questions on the comment box with, with your name and the country which you come from. So we'll be discussing all of them in the end. Uh, so moving on to the next talk, uh, it's by Dr. Pramod Chinda, who is my mentor and my guide who inspired me to take up orthopedic oncology. Uh, he is the director and head of the musculoskeletal oncology department at the HCG Hospital Bangalore and the Yellow Ribbon. He's been trained under Professor Fo at the National University Hospital Singapore and Dr. Manfrini at the Institute of Orthopedico Rizzoli and has been a staunch follower of their principles in the field of orthopedic oncology and reconstructive surgery. Uh, he founded the Yellow Ribbon, which is a dedicated center for sarcoma with the vision of becoming the world leader in managing bone and soft tissue tumors and to deliver the best possible outcome for every sector of the society. His area of special interest include biological reconstruction, robotic surgery, and 3D printing in orthopedic oncology. He started using Dinuzumab in India uh, even before the FDA, uh, FDA approved it when it costed around 1,200 US dollars per dose. Uh, he has tried Dinuzumab for various indications like international therapy, standalone therapy, and uh, other benign bone tumors as well. So he would be talking about his experience with Dinuzumab in 200 plus patients in the past decade. Over to you, Dr. Pramod. Unmute. Yeah. yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Suraj. And uh, thank you, Arani and uh, KC Wong and Dr. Manish for us sharing such a fantastic platform. So I would love to share my thoughts on the, uh, just a second. Okay. Uh, 
Am I, uh, my slides are up? Okay, so I wanted to, we have uh, come a long way in denosumab uh, the treatment. So I would say a big circle. Um, initially, we started in 2012, as uh, Dr. Suraj was mentioning. And also, I had just come back from Rizzoli when they were doing some research uh, about denosumab in pelvic uh, tumors and explained to this with some patients and uh, we could uh, start the experience with that. So we all know about why we use uh, denosumab. All the previous uh, speakers have spoken to about very highly complicated denosumab pelvic tumors uh, and uh, essentially the spine and the proximal limb recurrent whoop surgeries. So we had a 200 plus cases of giant cell tumor. Why? Because we have, ours is a tertiary care center where we usually get a complicated ones most of the time. Hence, uh, many of them went into the various doses of denosumab as we have discussed. And at least 30 to 40% of them went through the PET scan so that we could gain some experience of the PET scan as well in uh, giant cell tumor. So I would uh, like to uh, break my talk in the, the real life situations of how we came, how our circle landed here. So one is by the low dose therapy and the other one is the monotherapy. How do we use denosumab in the pre-operative settings? How in the post-operative settings? In children, does it have any role and the lungs? So in the low dose, we uh, recently published uh, the low dose uh, therapy in the clinical orthopedic and related research. So it depends on the site and size of the lesion, where essentially how easy to resect. In such an easy resectable, it's a single dose was more than enough. Uh, and within two weeks, we were able to get a good calcification as you see in this picture. So in, in a more complex uh, ones, we were able to, uh, we, we would add on to the uh, doses according to the case scenarios. So essentially, uh, as uh, as most tumors are completely different from one another, we have to tighten our treatment also. So thus, we have to come out with the protocol in the future. So in this case, we have to give about three doses and uh, after that, possibly resections. So one is this recurrent humorous. This is how we started uh, exploring the low dose, uh, humor, uh, low, low dose uh, denosumab with the help of a PET scan. When we saw the PET scan, it was more than 60 to 70 percent of the decrease in SUV, uh, quite significantly in one or two doses. Hence, we started uh, down regulating the denosumabs. So, uh, that's how we came out with the paper, and there was no differences between the short and the long term. With uh, Arani and Suraj, uh, we could publish this paper with the help of our pathologist, Dr. Veena and Dr. Mayur. So, and uh, all the clinical, radiological, and histopathological response were all the same in uh, whether we give less than three doses or more than three doses. So that's how we could uh, cut down the cost also. And at the same time, we were able to achieve uh, the re uh, outcome what we wanted. So also, we al also as um, these many of these papers have been already been told uh, that uh, denosumab increases the local recurrence rate. There's no doubt about it at all. So coming to the monotherapy. Monotherapy we used uh, in such, such cases of a diffuse pelvic uh, tumors like um, something like an ABC, GCT, so a Y diffuse pelvis, or an unresected or a partially resected uh, spinal uh, giant cell tumor. In distal radius, somehow we were not able to get a good uh, control rate. So in our series, it's about 90% recurrence, which is actually very high, but uh, we were not able to get it. I don't know the reason. We were, uh, the standards were followed. So example of this uh, monotherapy is this case, uh, the images are not very clear. So it's a diffuse kind of a disease in the uh, one side of the pelvis. We uh, diagnosed it as a giant cell tumor with the ABC component, kind of an unusual one. He is, uh, uh, to, uh, 2015, he took the standard protocol of six injections and, uh, and lost the follow-up. I could trace him today. <laughs> and made him send the video from his house. So he is uh, doing very well with just the monotherapy. He has not taken any injections from the last uh, uh, two years. He has been actually defaulted. So that's about his pelvis. And uh, regarding the distal radius, we are able to get the uh, uh, same kind of an approach. A couple of patients who are really uh, into understanding of the denosumab with the institutional review board. And um, with, uh, we have a, 
a medical student we have a person who require a right very precision uh, uh, functions such patients we are even thinking of a monotherapy as a denosumab uh, we have to come out with the protocol or how can we go ahead with these things so this is another lady uh, who had a uh, uh, curettage and recovered very fast in the hand and she is uh, she is a single woman i mean she is a woman with uh, she's got a lot of responsibilities at home and hence so she opted out very clearly that she would not go for a, a surgery again because in this case if you had to do a surgery it would have been probably a free vascular fibula graft and a fusion of this joint probably i don't know but uh, with these things she was able to move her hand uh, and presently she is completely uh, using a hand for most of the functions with a good control of the disease uh, this is another case of a monotherapy so preoperatively how do we use this uh, denosumab so when we know that it can be curated uh, when we know that particularly in tarsal or carpal areas where it is a kind of a dish, very difficult decision to remove the tumor or remove the bone and you cannot reconstruct we essentially ends up in the fusions and also in the new adjuvant as a curettage so we came out with uh, this uh, thing uh, principle as denosumab the 14th day so what we feel is in, if we are curating the the disease we have to operate at the 14th day not later than that because at that time you have a nice uh, little uh, film formed around the capsule like i show you here very aggressive one is a foot case so if you see this sorry 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 so this is how the nicely the wall has been uh, formed uh, see see how beautifully the uh, you can see the wall forming between the periosteum probably and it comes out like a scoop of ice cream without much difficulty if you do it beyond 14 or 15 days it becomes extremely difficult to cure it and particularly in an areas of tarsal bones or a couple bones so yes and uh, we were able to do a good curettage and also if you see there is a good amount of uh, nicely removed there is no tissues left behind at all it was very easy to remove in this case particularly otherwise usually denosumab causes more of a lot of problems this is at 9 months post a problem so she is able to walk she is quiet yeah so that's in the pre op setting the post op setting how so post op setting in the spine pelvis and in the sacrum essentially or uh, in the spine so in it many times you, in the spine if it is not done in an orthopedic oncology settings essentially most of them end up in uh, cure uh, decompressing and stabilizing so what has happened for this lady and uh, in these cases yes monotherapy has really given a good bane of relief and sometimes we do once it gets into control we do cure the smaller areas of the so that it prevents the recurrence this is one of our case of so, such an approach of a longest follow up in uh, for 8 years so if you see this is a sacral gct again twice operated uh recurred multiple times uh, he was one of the is the first case of denosumab in 2012 so we did a, uh, about uh, 10 doses of denosumab and uh, went in for a uh, curettage yes there was absolutely zero cells remained after the after the denosumab injections so so this is uh, he is able to do most of the things uh, and is he had a he had a baby as well after this now 8 years no now since last 2 years he has not taken any uh, denosumab injections so we are just closely following up for the any kind of a local recurrence so in children so we did uh, take an institutional review board approval and also discussed in the multidisciplinary team board and gave for one of the uh, a couple of children one of them was a uh, spine c2 spine uh, which was a massive expansile lesion which was causing compression on the cord so we we could give half dose that is 1 mg per kg and uh, it responded pretty well 
within the the next uh, two weeks we operated and curated she is disease free after post surgery she took one dose and after that she has not taken anything and also we used similar one for a distal fibula in the lungs as uh, dr arani was mentioning we have a varied experience actually we our experience with the denosumab and lungs is not good so this is how uh, we have given one gentleman uh, over the last 8 uh, years he finally he could suck, he succumbed in fact in him we even tried the intralesional denosumab which was of uh, not it just did not work at all so this is one of the case uh, shared uh, to me by dr laura campanacci where she said it it works yes uh, we have to see find out whom we have to give so these are some of the protocols i think uh, with all the team of uh, rani dr manish dr kc we have to come out with the protocol sooner so there is uh, as i said there is no response in the lungs so pet scan is definitely an indication uh, is needed in complex cases definitely it works well uh, if we have to see the response also to for our research purposes and to see if there is early local recurrences in an allograft or a metal inside we cannot image mri or a ct scan alone to see if there is any early recurrence pet scan has really helped in that uh, in those cases this is one case where the femoral head we could see this uh, adverse effect of a partial necrosis and there's one tetany and that's about it and we other cases what we have tried is chondroblastoma it is not worked abc it works telangiectasia osteosarcoma it doesn't work peripartum we did not have any problem in giving on a peripartum time so there is uh, associated malignant issues we we actually had three cases we removed one because we found out that case had a sat b2 positive prior so sat b2 positive shows that it was malignant from beginning so we removed one so ended up having only the two cases which we are still uh, having a question whether is there will there be any malignant issues i'm sure arani agrees about that but we have, we still question about it and we have to come out with uh, more gen detailed genetic analysis on that as i said we published this uh, report that under less than three injections are also equally beneficial so as i covered the low dose uh, therapy uh, definitely works monotherapy in a selected indications pre op is indicated in complex cases post operative therapy is definitely in spine pelvis and how do we taper them so sometimes we have tapered for like uh, first two years we give every 3 months after that every 6 months we give and we closely watch them so that's the paper we will be coming soon and the children yes we have to be careful and uh, it has worked well lungs yes we need to correctly stratify the data and the cases and uh, use on the lungs thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, thank you suraj over to you thank you sir thank you for the talk so like you mentioned a uh, few indications for tenosumab like the monotherapy there's still a lot of doubts there is a need for uh, a protocol to be set after discussing with multiple different uh, institutions and settings uh, because then we don't know when to stop how much to give how to space out the therapy if we can really stop how long to follow up so there are many questions still uh, not very clear when it comes to topics like monotherapy so we'll be uh, discussing yeah. about the questions uh, later so the next speaker is uh, uh, dr manish agarwal dr manish agarwal uh, started his journey in orthopedics in km hospital mumbai before joining tata memorial hospital mumbai after a decade uh, at the tmh he moved to induja hospital and medical research center mumbai and has been working as consultant orthopedic oncology ever since During his career, which has spanned over two decades till date, he pioneered the technique of perforating allograft and using them for limb salvage surgeries, developing and using affordable indigenous processes, use of non-invasive expandable processes in children, help evolve and develop technique of extracorporeal irradiation, thereby revolutionizing orthopedic oncology in India. Apart from these clinical achievements, academically he. apart uh, he has numerous publications to his name in international journals and he is also the reviewer for clinical orthopedic and related research and jbjs he has also trained and mentored many aspiring orthopedic tumor surgeons in india through his fellowship courses 
I kindly request Dr. Manish Agarwal sir to take us through 10 take home lessons for using Dinosumab in 2020. This is very important because like we discussed earlier, the trend of using Dinosumab has been changing every year. So we would like to know what is the present trend, 10 lessons to take home. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Suraj, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Pramod, uh, for getting all of us together. And uh, as Dr. Irani said, this is really a hot topic. And it is something of great importance to discuss because so much knowledge has now come in since the time of Denosumab came in. What I am really amazed by is that almost all of us now seem to agree what Denosumab should be used and just tells us that we are now probably on the right path. Now, when, as we all said that when, when uh, Denosumab came, it was almost like a magic potion for giant cell tumors and uh, I, I think all of us thought that uh, surgeons would now not have a role. But fortunately for us, uh, I, I think Tenosumab does, does not obviate the need of surgery as we know. And that'd be one of the things. And our initial, initially what we saw was that in, in tumors which were extremely uh, uh, progressive, uh, destroying bone rapidly, we were able to control them with the Tenosumab. And, and it was amazing to see how bone was forming in areas which were otherwise uh, being destroyed. We also saw histologically some amazing changes and uh, uh, we all thought that maybe like neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the amount of necrosis that we see may be able to tell us how the giant cell tumor is, has responded to this. But again, this, this wasn't true. And, and just like in anything new, we have gone through the hype curve. Uh, our, our inflated expectations have gone into disillusionment. And, and I think now I'm happy that uh, we are reaching a plateau of productivity where we know how we are going to use this particular drug. So this talk is going to be essentially uh, a summation of whatever we have heard from the other speakers. And, and it also includes some of our experiences about uh, uh, using denosumab in giant cell tumors. So let's begin with the first take home message. And the most important thing I think to understand is that denosumab, unlike chemotherapy, does not kill the neoplastic cells in giant cell tumor. And Dr. Wong very beautifully explained through the original research work done by them that it's actually, it acts on the effector. It acts on the soldiers of the neoplastic cells of giant cell tumors, the soldiers who actually affect damage. So once you control the osteoclast, the giant cell tumor is no longer able to cause damage in the bone and that's how it causes ossification and the healing as we think. But it also means that the moment we stop the denosumab, the neoplastic cells can, can grow once again. And, and this particular study, which was uh, uh, published on uh, tissues. They took tissues on, of uh, giant cell tumors which had been treated with denosumab and they actually showed that once denosumab was withdrawn, they were able to grow those neoplastic cells. Although their growth rate was decreased, they still were able to grow. And again, as Dr. Wong uh, uh, pointed out, they clearly showed that denosumab was not the same as bisphosphonates. And this is something we have to understand and use. Denosumab uh, works in a, on a different mechanism and has probably a shorter lived action compared to bisphosphonates which have a much longer action. And unlike the bisphosphonates which seem to have an anti-neoplastic effect, they work on the spindle cells as well. The denosumab does not have any action on the neoplastic cells. That also gives us an option that we could actually combine these two drugs to get a more potent response in those cases which don't respond to one of these agents alone. So the second take home message therefore is that the, in spite of using denosumab, especially for tumors in the limbs, I don't think anybody would withdraw surgery. I think we all now know that there are, you can divide the giant cell tumors into two kinds of cases. Those where surgery is possible and those what we would call as unresectable. 
So huge tumors in the spine, pelvis, where we can't get a good curettage, maybe the unresectable ones where you would use nanosumab, and if one does that, we probably have to use it for life. But any case where we want to uh, withdraw the denosumab or use it only for short time, surgery has to be added to the denosumab therapy. Now, how we learned this is this classic example, huge giant cell tumor. We almost thought this is malignant, but biopsy clearly showed this is a benign giant cell tumor. Huge soft tissue component. He was offered an amputation initially at some other place, but uh, denosumab had come in and we were able to put him on denosumab and the whole thing shrunk. The soft tissue mass shrunk, the bone started to heal and you could see this. This is when we realized that uh, denosumab has absolutely profound effects sometimes on the bone. And in fact, you can see that the metacarpal has collapsed here and, and we were uh, sorry that we actually didn't for the metacarpal. We did not do anything for him because his symptoms had gone away, his function was recovering, and then we decided, okay, what we will do is do a lengthening of his metacarpal. We lengthened his metacarpal, and over a period of time, his function improved. But in a few months, he had recurrence. So again, as we know that it is, it is not going to be okay to just observe this patient even after a long-term denosumab therapy. This patient was on denosumab for almost two years, but uh, the moment we stopped denosumab, he recurred. The, the tumor came back. So the message number three is that a curettage that we do is not going to be any different from what we would have done had denosumab not been given, which means that we have to plan our curettage according to the pre-denosumab margins. That means you have to go right to the extent that we were able to see it on the imaging and actually go beyond it if we want to achieve a good extended cure attach. And again, we learned this the hard way. This was a giant cell tumor in the distal radius. You can see that ossification has happened after the denosumab therapy. So uh, this is uh, what we, uh, we, when we went in for surgery, it, it looked like we had uh, curated well. There was nice hard uh, bone against which we burred out. When we look at the post-op x-ray, it is very obvious here that we haven't gone to the margin of the tumor. And as we know now that it would happen in every case, this patient recurred. We were a little surprised at that time, but that was the part of our learning that you cannot get a lesser margin or you can't do a lesser curettage, even if you are treated with lots of tenosumab and it looks like there is good bone. You have to go towards the end of the margin. So when we had opened this up, you can see, I mean, as everybody has said before, it looks like firm, gritty bone, curettage looks easier. Tumor does not spill into the soft tissues. So we, it looks like we, we were very happy at the end of this. You burr it, you have got nice boundaries. You can see this sound, kind of sound which comes, tells you that you've got nice hard cortical bone. But this is absolutely missing. You can see even on the fur, Hard bone. But we realized after, after all this that we had still not reached the margin of the cavity and, and, and we ended up with a recurrence in this case. So the next take home message then is that though it looks like the bone formation is going to make curettage easier. It is actually making curettage more difficult because we cannot identify where we need to stop. We therefore need to use imaging to understand that we have reached the margins and not to penetrate the joint because we don't have a clue from the field whether we have reached the subchondral bone or the subchondral cartilage. So if we give a lot of doses of denosumab, denosumab is going to make the curettage more difficult. Uh, the other problem that we find is the ossification which is happening is pretty irregular and because of which tumor cells remain trapped between these various layers of bone which have formed and probably that is the reason why we get such a high local recurrence rate after denosumab as, as has been spoken by Dr. Irani and uh, Pramod also has published and pointed this out. So what we now ensure is that we use imaging as you can see in this case of a distal radius giant cell tumor, we make sure that we have gone to the complete margins wherever we have done the nosmap therapy.
The next message is, as has been pointed out and has been now published very uh, in, in numerous articles, is that denosumab does increase the local recurrence rate. And uh, when we first published it in CORR after the ISOL's uh, presentation, there was a little bit of a resistance uh, from many people who did not believe that uh, denosumab actually would increase the local recurrence. In fact, uh, people we had spoken to uh, denied that uh, denosumab said would increase local recurrence. They all thought that we've not done enough uh, adequate cure attacks. But when we did a case control study, it was very obvious to us that uh, the local recurrence rate is higher. And again, this paper uh, by Pramod uh, shows very clearly that uh, denosumab does increase the local recurrence rate. So again, therefore, a word of caution that don't use denosumab unless we know what we are doing and how many doses we are giving, as we'll come to in the later. Now, unlike with intralegional surgery, I think denosumab makes the resections a lot easier. And this, again, we learned from cases which we initially planned for a cure attack, but then realized that we have to do a resection. And we found that even with a few doses of denosumab, you get a nice hard shell. Uh, you can separate the important neurovascular structures or the tendons from the hard shell and, and therefore take out the tumor without spilling it. And this was a big advantage in bones like the uh, distal radius or the proximal fibula where spillage was very easy if the tumor was absolutely gelatinous. So again, in this case, you can see in the proximal radius, the denosumab actually solidified the tumor and we could take it out as end block without spilling anything in the tissues. And I believe that this therefore helps in reducing the local recurrence that we would otherwise get because of spillage. This is another huge recurrent uh, giant cell tumor in the distal femur. And again, uh, before resection, giving denosumab actually helped us separate out the neurovascular bundle from the hard surface of, of the tumor and, and then resect this tumor out. The next message, as uh, again Pramod has shown, we still don't know what is the optimum uh, dose of denosumab. I think we were all initially told and we diligently gave uh, weekly denosumab for the first three doses, then we gave uh, uh, monthly doses. But we have now realized that probably just two or three doses are good enough to harden the shell and reduce the vascularity. And this reduction of vascularity is probably going to be important in areas like the pelvis or the sacrum, where we now no longer need to use embolization. So it's, a, it's actually a cost saving by using denosumab because it's much cheaper than the embolization procedure. Even in uh, proximal tumors like the proximal humerus or the proximal femur where the tumors are huge and we are planning a cure attach, a few doses, a couple of doses of uh, denosumab can greatly reduce the vascularity and therefore the blood loss at surgery without affecting the cure attach. The next take home message is what has been again shown by all our speakers before is that uh, denosumab probably can uh, cause a malignant transformation. We, we saw it in one of our cases here in the proximal humerus uh, we had reviewed his biopsies once, once he had developed a malignant transformation, uh, feeling that maybe we have dismissed a primary malignant giant cell tumor, but we reconfirmed this from uh, uh, specialized musculoskeletal uh, pathologies, including sending them abroad. And this was very clearly an osteosarcoma, which came in after the patient had been treated with denosumab. So we believe that this was a malignant transformation caused by denosumab. And after this, we've had one more case. And and we know that now there have been several publications and everybody has seen at least one case uh, when they have treated patients with denosumab that there is a malignant transformation. So here we have to be cautious about using denosumab because you're converting in a benign tumor into a malignant tumor in some of the cases. So we have to take care. Otherwise, uh, barring this malignant transformation, Denosumab has shown to be a very safe drug, particularly if we use just a few doses, maybe two or three doses. With this kind of dosing, we've not really seen any uh, long-term uh, complications. We've not seen osteonecrosis of the jaw in any patient who's, been, uh, who's not been on long-term denosumab. And the last thing that we would say is that we should not forget that we may withdraw denosumab, but you cannot stop the calcium and vitamin D supplementation for a long time. Probably six months, 
better to be a year at least after stopping denosumab because um, any time we use bisphosphonates or denosumab, we know that the consumption of vitamin D and calcium increases and the levels drops. Therefore, this supplementation has to continue for a, a much longer period of time. So just to summarize, I think the best indication for using denosumab would be to reduce the vascularity, as I said before. We can use it prior to resection where it's extremely beneficial and you need very few doses. But we have to be very cautious in using denosumab for intralegional surgery. We have to be prepared for a higher rate of local recurrence. And if we do try to use it, we must know what is going to be our end point. So if we know that we are going to use it till bone forms in certain critical areas like in the joint or like in this case, you can see that the anterior wall of the tibia where the patellar tendon was attached would have been important for us to maintain and preserve. That is where denosumab helped. And we would advise that you use denosumab only till the time you have got your endpoint and not give any more than that so that the cure touch can still be done effectively without leaving behind tumor. Sometimes the patient is very young, the tumor is very huge, and we are forced into uh, taking a patient for intralegional surgery, which may be construed as, as uh, probably an extended indication, like in this case. This patient actually came to us with this flexion deformity of 30 degrees, and, and he was using a stick to walk, a really massive giant cell tumor. Would have been very easy to resect, but he was very young. He was just in his 20s, so we gave him denosumab. After denosumab, the tumor ossified well. Then we went ahead and curated it, and you can see how well that shell has formed there. It's actually, uh, um, there was a fracture which has mal healed, but he still had a good range of knee motion. So we actually went ahead, put in allograft, and we put some of his autograft, and you can see that we actually tilted his condyle to correct his flexion deformity, because his knee would otherwise not straighten. And this healed, well, but as we were expecting, because the curatage is, is never going to be as effective in such a tumor like this, we, we did end up with a recurrence in about eight months' time. You can see this MRI showing recurrence all around uh, the tumor, but unlike uh, in the previous surgery, this time we had a shell of bone against which we could curate this. So we went ahead, cleaned up again the entire tumor, and we put in cement this time and, and put in a plate. And this patient uh, currently has extremely useful function and is walking and we were able to save his knee and avoid a prosthetic knee. So this is where I feel that denosumab is a tool in our hands. And if you can use it judiciously, it can be used to great benefit. In uh, giant cell tumors, I think we can afford to hug the tiger. As we say, we don't do these things. We would not take these risks in malignant tumors. But if we use denosumab effectively, it can be a very useful tool. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for summarizing the 10 points which, uh, which is necessary to treat the giant cell tumor, tumor of the bone with denosumab. In fact, you've answered so many questions which the viewers have been asking. Uh, so we'll move on to the question and answer round now. So uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Casey Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong, the first question uh, is for you. Uh, you said that the stromal cells, the denosumab has no activity on the stromal cells at all. So the question is, uh, when we use denosumab to uh, downgrade the tumor before surgery, is there a need uh, for it to act on the stromal cells? Wouldn't it be enough if the lesion consolidates well and we perform the surgery because we are planning for surgery anyways? So what is the need for a drug to act on the stromal cells if you're planning for surgery? I, I think it really depends on what kind of surgery you, you plan. So for example, for you say it's for intralesional keratage. So uh, in our experience and also from the speaker's experience, I think uh, after the nosomap actually is uh, basically make the curatage more difficult. In addition to more difficult to curatage, the problem is you cannot identify where is the stromal cell. As compared with those without the, any uh, sort of uh, the nosomap, once you open the cortical window, you curatage the tumor tissue. Actually, it is a brownish and also yellowish uh, color. So it's easy to identify grossly. But once you give a denosumab, it can become very fibrotic. Actually, you, you don't know where, is the, where is actually the tumor margin is. 
And that's the reason why for some of the cases that uh, we have given the in, in, in our initial experience that uh, after giving tenosumab for few dose, they got a lot of classification. So all the tumor is actually surrounded by all this bone. And then at, at that time, we think that we need to have a better imaging reference in order to, to, to attack to the bottom or the margin of the, of the interstitial keratage. And that's why I show the case that uh, in some of our case that we, we need a, a, a interoperative uh, navigation to help us to identify the, the, the margin. So the, initially we want to decrease, uh, we think that this drug can, can help us to make the surgery easier. But uh, on the other hand, after getting this drug, um, in addition, you make the surgery more difficult and also may increase the local recurrence. Actually, it defeats our initial uh, purpose of uh, uh, doing an uh, intraditional curative task to decrease the local recurrence. And that's why in this year, in those cases, we think that curative task so, is okay. We, we actually stop giving upfront uh, denosomab. We just give one or two doses of uh, somita and then could quickly go for curative task for that. Okay, that, that was actually my second question. What is the dose regulation of zolendronic acid before surgery? How many days dose do you use? Uh, how do you... So uh, how for for zolendronic acid, um, we normally will stop. Uh, we maximum so we, we give is two dose. Because uh, in the past, uh, more than 10 years ago, so we have one or two cases that actually the tumor progress on uh, upfront uh, zolendronic acid after three or four dose. So, so that, that means the more bone was, destruct, uh, was destroyed and then um, more bone will lost during the career touch. So then we, we find that um, as compared with dinosomal, so, so in general exit is less potent uh, for the osteocastic activities. And also in some cases that uh, actually it cannot control and then it will progress. And then we don't know which one will progress. And then that's why we, we just uh, stop uh, one or two, two dose um, and quickly go for our surgery. And then uh, uh, each dose we will separate at least two weeks. Two to three, two to four weeks. Normally, the the calcium level will will, will decrease uh, within uh, two weeks time. So after two weeks of the of the surgeon exit, we'll probably go for uh, for surgery for for the patient. Okay, so basically, maybe two doses of zolendronic acid, and then give two weeks gap, and then go ahead with the surgery. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, okay. I have one question for Doctor Wong. Mm. Uh, look, looking at all uh, the data that we are getting with denosumab and bisphosphonates, do you think it would be sensible to use denosumab uh, pre-surgery and bisphosphonates post-surgery to get the best of uh, benefits of both these drugs? Uh, as now, basically, uh, seeing the time we use denosumab, after the surgery, we will give uh, soningenic acid. We could somita. We 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 will not give uh, dinosumab. Given that actually the, the dinosumab have no effect on the on the stromal cell itself, so we will not give uh, postoperatively dinosumab unless uh, the the tumors recur. The patient don't want a surgery. Got a big morbidity after the surgery. Otherwise, uh, for for those uh, uh, touchable uh, lesion or receptable lesion. Uh, we just give a syngenic exit, uh, hopefully to decrease the uh, local recurrence by inhibiting uh, for the stromal cells. And how much zoledronic acid uh, you need to give and for how long to reduce uh, it? We, in the past, we don't know actually the, the, the regime for that. We only give three doses. Why we come to three doses, you don't know. But, but for our case, we give three doses. So three doses then, monthly, so, monthly? Monthly, yes, monthly. So that's yes, what monthly. we've been doing as well. So. Okay. Okay. So the next question is the cost factor. Again, it's it's kind of continuation of the previous question. Zolendronic acid is an excellent alternative to denosumab. We've all seen that. Apart from the controlled action of denosumab, the cost is a major issue for the use of denosumab. Maybe not in the West where most of the patients are insured or like they come under the uh, trials and stuff. Uh, but when we are using denosumab, uh, especially for a prolonged duration, cost is a major issue. Is that a problem in Italy and uh, Hong Kong or the cost never plays a role in deciding treatment? How is it? Uh, I, I, I answer first. Um, the, of okay. course, it should not be a problem. It should not be a problem for, for in Hong Kong. So, okay. so the general exit now is, uh, is, uh, is less expensive now as compared with denosumab. So now, because we treat, uh, change our regime to a uh, uh, somita, so, so that cost shouldn't be a problem for treating our patient. Okay. How about in Italy, Dr. Arani? Is cost a factor for you to decide how much denosumab do you use, how long do you use? So in Italy, we have a healthy public system. So 
the health system for patients is free. And so no problems to, to have the nosumab. And um, uh, as you know, in the past we used the nosumab. Now uh, we, um, we use the nosumab only if, you, if we plan a, a resection in, for giant cell tumor in a difficult, uh, difficult uh, locations. Uh, such as the pelvis or the spine, but you know it's not a down staging uh, treatment. We, if you plan a resection, you can uh, um, treat patient with a very short therapy as you publish, and and then uh, perform a resection that is much easier. Okay, I have one question. Sorry, uh, yes, sir. To, uh, I think Casey. Uh, yes. Thing is, uh, we have a group of patients about, uh, if I'm not wrong, about four of them who have been repeatedly been biopsied and turned that they are not turning to malignancy. In spite of that, uh, giving denosumab is not working in these uh, gentlemen. This raises a question how uh, it is not responding in these. Uh, in fact, we have done a PET scan and a PET guided biopsy to make sure that we are not missing any malignancy anywhere. So they have not turned malignant but uh, the, uh, the disease is progressing into the lungs and also locally, and denosumab is not working. Is there a role in such patients uh, to shift to a zoledronic, for example, in the lungs and the local record? We have four patients right now. Um, it, it's difficult to say. I, I think uh, oh, if we uh, already rule out is a um, um, sarcomas, it's, we're still treating a giant cell tumor bone. So let's say for in Hong Kong or in, uh, I think some of the centers, we are routinely doing the X3, F3 um, uh, mutation or G34 staining to just to make sure that is we are treating a GCT. So uh, after that, I think uh, the current uh, understanding and the drug available is uh, uh, Somita and also uh, the Nosomap. So the other drugs, I don't think uh, we got a good evidence so to support uh, the other use of this. So uh, in our preclinical studies, simvastatin is one of the drugs that can, um, uh, in the in, in vitro study, that can have anti-tumor effect and also promote uh, 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 the thermal cell differentiation. Whether it's uh, off the label use in this kind of case, I, I, I don't know, but, but it definitely is one of, one of the uh, option because you don't have other option left. So it's one of the options to, to do this. So I don't have a concrete answer for that. Uh, Dr. Irani, uh, do you have any comments on the patients where we are, don't have any answer for that? That means we have exhausted all the uh, weapons. So we just can't wait them uh, to die of a lung disease or anything. Is there any uh, solutions? We, in fact, we tried an intralesional therapy of denosumab as well. Intra-arterial therapy of denos, uh, zoledronic acid, we tried for a lung disease. Uh, none of them were working. And finally, ends up as a palliative radiation. We know that it's not going to work. Yeah. Anything? Any comments on that? I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, it is mandatory that the diagnosis is correct because you can find giant cells in every type of uh, uh, bone tumors. So. Uh, usually, when uh, um, when um, uh, we in, in four percent of patients we can have lung mats, but usually the prognosis is uh, still a good prognosis. So if you treat this patient with wait and see or uh, surgery or medical treatment, but you know it, this is a benign tumor, so nobody dies for giant cell tumor. So if the the the, the, the case is uh, um, is an exceptional case. You have to be sure about the diagnosis. So I, I don't, I, I don't have a, another answer. Okay. I, I had the same question. That is, is it likely that uh, the tumor can become resistant to denosumab or bisphosphonates? Would it happen that prolonged usage would cause it? I mean, what have been the experience of these trials which have followed up these patients for a long time? and they've given them multiple doses. Do any of these people become resistant to the drug and then the tumor starts growing back again at some stage?
Dr. Wong, any experience with development of resistance with dinosumab uh, in biological? We, we, we have uh, one or two cases of sickle giant cell tumor bone. So we did a curatage and also a post op somita. And then um, the patient stabilized with the disease uh, two to three years later. And then we did another course of somita and it stabilized a bit. But later on, it progressed on the somita. And then at that time, uh, we have a uh, dinosumab um, uh, in Hong Kong. And then we give dinosumab. It got a very good response, uh, shrinking of the tumor, calcify the tumors. And now it actually stabilized. It now is uh, around, I think it's 10 years after the initial treatment. Whether these uh, two drugs can have a synergistic effect on the tumor, I, I, I don't know. But definitely uh, in our experience with a somita, some of the giant cell tumor actually is not responding too much for, 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 for these uh, uh, somita drugs. So um, we still don't know uh, from our experience or clinical study where, whether we got a resistance or not. As I mentioned in my talk that uh, one of the problems for this uh, cerebral cell, we are, we are difficult to develop an animal model. If we can develop an animal model in a, in a, in a, a loop mice type of uh, animal model, basically we can test the drugs. The problem we, we, we can't develop the, the animal model because of the, of the nature of the stromal cell is not exactly like the cancer type of cells. So it's still difficult. We are struggling whether we can do a, a, a animal model or not. We, we are working on this. Okay. Uh, my next question is to uh, Dr. Manish Agarwal. So one of the uh, pictures which you showed, uh, the distal femur case. So after recurrence with dinosumab, you initially you had put the bone graft and later you went in with cement. Yes. So in cases where you actually use dinosumab as a new adjuvant, where you have to salvage the joint, maybe a few doses, do you have any specifications between using bone graft and bone cement? No, actually I used the bone graft because I wanted, I knew that he's going to recur. And I wanted a uh, good bone stock when he recurred so that we would be able to still go ahead and salvage the knee. So that was the whole uh, uh, thought process behind using bone rather than using cement at that time. I feel that uh, if you use cement, particularly if it goes into the subcondyl areas, when you do revision surgery, it makes it uh, 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 far more difficult to salvage the joint, particularly if the subcondyl bone is very thin then it becomes uh, a lot more difficult. So I, I generally use bone for the younger people where I want the bone stock to be uh, preserved or to restore. And then, then if required, then uh, once, once we knew where the recurrence is after we have uh, got a shell of bone, then it was much easier for me to cure it and still have a good bony shell. And therefore I use cement because I still had a good amount of bone remaining and, and cement was good for it. Okay. Okay, sir. And uh, with regards to complications, uh, what we have observed is we don't get that many osteonecrosis of the jaw with dinosumab. And like you mentioned, even in your series, uh, osteonecrosis is very less when compared to the Western literature. Like the Italian studies, they had a lot of osteonecrosis at least when compared to just one or two cases. Uh, one thing different in their series was the median number of dinosumabs were uh, significantly more in their series. So is there a geographical uh, difference in developing osteonecrosis of the jaw because even in the west we have, we see that a lot of dinosumab papers patient end up with osteonecrosis so, so apart that's again a question which i want to know is whether the number is important whether the number of doses is important yes combining it with bisphosphonates is going to be important like we know even in myeloma when, when dinosumab or bisphosphonates is used if you add steroids then the risk of getting osteonecrosis jaw was much higher so i don't know what has been the experience of uh, we're using it over a long term because we don't use it uh, long term in most of our patients. There are very few patients who get it for a long period of time. Yes, true. So maybe the number of the median number of doses they do have a role to play. And uh, with regards to the malignant transformation, so we all know that there is a possibility of malignant transformation with dinosumab. It's a known fact. Uh, but the re the recent paper which came out in December of last year in the Lancet uh, in 500 plus patient by uh, Chavla et al. The incidence of malignant transformation was just one. They had 5% of malignant transformation, but when they reviewed the slides later on, they realized that they had misdiagnosed it as GCT. So do you actually counsel the patients for a possibility of malignant transformation? Is it a routine 
in your clinical practice or since since you consider it as a rare possibility you you just keep it at the back of your mind well i i would definitely counsel the patient and i don't think we can run away from the fact that uh, these are real cases i have no doubt that uh, you can get malignant transformation particularly because after using denosumab again uh, we are doing surgery and for some reason maybe when we add the surgical uh, procedure that is also uh, causing some uh, transformation in these neoplastic cells uh, maybe that's the reason why this lancet study which was basically very few surgical cases and most of them were unresectable cases on long term denosumab they've not been operated maybe that's why they have not been turned malignant but i think all the rest of us who who treated enough number of cases with denosumab we all have at least one case where which we believe is is a malign to malignant transformation i don't know what do uh, dr wong pramod uh, dr irani feel for 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 my understanding from the in vitro studies because the denosumab uh, uh, does not affect the stromal cell that means that uh, it will not not affect the genetic makeup of the stromal cells that means theoretically from the uh, preclinical studies it should not be able to make a malignant transformation of the, from the stromal cell to sarcomas because it don't have any any tumor effect or any effect on the stromal cell itself so from our belief that uh, we don't think uh, the denosumab can uh, change the genetic makeup of the stromal cell that result in a sarcoma change so that's why for all these giant cell tumor bone we insist that we must uh, uh, have the x3 f3 uh, g mutation or g34 uh, staining just to make sure that we can retouch a giant cell tumor bone but not a giant cell uh, a giant cell rich of sarcoma or giant cell rich lesion with a sarcoma that's the most important to make a correct diagnosis for this you do sat b2 sat b2 marker also do you for 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 the histology part uh this uh, g34 uh state uh, uh immunochemical staining that's the uh, x3 uh, f3 uh, g mutation is the most important so uh pathology uh, 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 uh paper showing that more than 90 more than 90 percent of gct actually is uh, positive for this so in in, in last few years we routinely do this you, if you don't have this result we, we will not treat as a gct or bone this is very important. You can retouch a sarcoma this day. And... <laughs> okay, that's a good lesson. Yeah. Rani, you have yeah. any comments on the genetics part of it? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know if the risk of malignant transformation is 1% or 4%. I just know that um, um, a meta-analysis of the literature reported that the risk of uh, second cancer in, in metastatic Cancer patients um, um, is uh, is significantly um, the risk of uh, second cancer is significantly higher in patients treated with denosumab than zolendronic acid. So, I mean, um, we are not talking about uh, a malignant tumor. We are talking about a benign tumor. So usually nobody dies, and um, uh, in uh, usually young population with a long life expectancy. So. I mean, I, I, I have no answers, but, uh, you know, with my patients, I have to say that maybe in the literature, there are reports that report that the risk is 1%, 4%. And so um, uh, if it is possible, as uh, in, in the paper, by, from your paper, uh, the only way to reduce the risk is reduce the, 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 the therapy. So the period of therapy. So I think um, you know that because we don't have an answer, uh, it's um, better to say the, to patients that uh, there is a very very low risk, but maybe there is a, a risk. So let's summarize this: like on the biopsy, when you send for histopathology, we will uh, anymore send for the. Uh, H3, F3A mutation also. Uh, I think that that's, uh, we, that's a lesson from us. Also, the SAT-B2 also we have incorporated thanks to our pathologist, Dr. Kunal and others who wanted to have that and it has helped us quite a lot. Yeah, so Suraj, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, the viewers are interested to know what is the best way to assess the response 
uh, post dinuzumab manish agarwal sir uh, rightly mentioned that our treatment planning should be purely based on the pre dinuzumab volume so that we don't miss out on any tumors uh, but they are planning for a curettage after dinuzumab they want to know what is the ideal way to assess the response like what investigations to uh, make sure that they have before the surgery but like i said i mean if i have a definite end point i look for that so if if that is visible on an x ray then the x ray is good but very often if i'm going to use a very small dose maybe only two doses or three doses then i don't think the x ray is that sensitive for me to know whether the shell has formed in the critical area that i desired so then i do a ct i just do a simple ct get a few slices of the ct and once i see that shell then we take the patient in for a curettage in that area so the, 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 otherwise in most of the other cases i i don't think i i am not using now for uh, intralegional surgery at all most of the times we don't use the nosmap now but if it is for a resection again uh, i think uh, i don't use any additional imaging we just you give two or three doses and it always solidifies mm -hmm. so there again i'm not waiting for a bony shell to form so i don't have an end point there so it's only in those cases Bone to form in the surgery, then I would do a CT. If I don't see it on the X. Okay, uh, we have one more question uh, from Dr. Utkarsh Pal from Madhya Pradesh. He wants to know the role of uh, combined use of zolondronic and dinuzumab in patients. Like maybe you start off with dinuzumab, logistic issues, cost issues. You cannot use dinuzumab. Can you switch to zolondronic acid? or vice versa can you switch between the two drugs is like uh, is it possible is it an option uh, for downgrading the tumor no but what is the indication i mean is it going to be for intralegional surgery or for a resection uh, no he wants to know it for inoperable cases inoperable cases inoperable. yes any thoughts maybe dr wong can uh, I, I, i think as uh, the clinical study and what we understand for gct of bone i think uh, so uh, so genetic access definitely is one of the choice if cause is a problem for the dinosomal because uh, although this uh, less uh, uh, potent for the also caustic activities but uh, definitely uh, from our previous experience that uh, Uh, I I believe most of our cases that are um, uh, a response is only some selected case it is not responding, but we we don't know. We we need to follow up them them for that. If cause is an issue, I think uh, the the sulinjana exit, I think is definitely a choice. As I mentioned that for in for if you plan for intraditional keratage, now in this year we just stop the nosomal. We just give uh, one or two dose uh, uh, sulinjana exit, do the keratage, easier for the keratage. And then post up three dose, and then observe. No more hot dinner. So if you plan for a traditional care attach. Okay, yeah, like most of us agree, no more dinner. So much for international care attach. <laughs> so that's that's what I think. All of us have, so, and, and maybe because all of us believe in that. Yeah, this is so much different when compared to a seminar which you would be hearing about dinner. So much maybe four years uh, before. So everyone will be talking about the positive aspects of dinuzumab, but this has been more of the negative aspects of dinuzumab. Do not yes. use it or cut down. So it's, it's changed <laughs> drastically in just a few years. Yeah. For negative aspects, it's about using it correctly. Correctly, we yeah. Yes. Where it is useful, and we have learned where yeah. it is not going to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. True. I think we have learned it from experience. So that's that's the biggest teacher as we we've seen all along. <laughs> and once we've seen it is not useful, then then why do we want to use it? True. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, we have one more question by Dr. Jyoti Prakash from uh, Kolkata. He wants to know the uh, optimum duration between uh, the end of dinuzumab and surgery. Uh, we spoke about the 14 dinuzumab uh, after surgery on the 14th day. Some people say it's one month. So he wants to have a general consensus on the number of days which is required between the end of dinuzumab and surgery. And he also wants to know if there is a change in protocol with respect to the anatomical site. Like, is it different for pelvis? Different for radius? So, can we have a general consensus between the end of the surgery? I think this is, this is where we may not agree with each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll try to we'll try to calculate mean from the <laughs> answers from four different speakers. Uh, uh, yeah, for for me at least two weeks. Two weeks because okay. at least two weeks because uh, the calcium level need to some time to stabilize. 
And then as far as I understand and in our experience, if you stop the nusumab, let's say for more than three months, the tumor will go back. So the duration must be uh, two weeks to three months for us, for, 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 uh, for, for my team, yeah. Okay. 14 days from Hong Kong. Dr. Rani? <laughs> we usually wait uh, one month, 30 days. Okay. 30 days. Yes, so that's, that's usually what even I do. Uh, it's between three and four weeks. We generally, before the next dose is due, we say then you get surgery done. Because then, then you're, you're actually escaping from the effect and the tumor could grow back. So, so maybe an ideal window is, is uh, between three and four weeks. Okay. After the last dose. And, and we don't use more than two or three doses, even otherwise. Yes, mm. yes, true. Now we have come to actually one dose. I mean, 14 days because we saw um, four cases, we saw a thin, nice layer where we can put a periosteal, ele blunt periosteal elevator, not even a sharp one. So a nice blunt periosteal elevator, you run through, you get a nice, like a chunk of tumor. So that's when uh, we, uh, all these four cases are doing well right now, but uh, yeah, that's a consensus we have to come. Yes, so ba the basic consensus is roughly, I would say, three weeks so that we can agree with all of them. So three weeks are from the end of dinosumab. And again, like we have stressed before, if it is straightly operable, curatable lesion, no dinosumab. If, if you want to salvage the joint, if you really need some form of help, then maybe just one, two, or maybe maximum three doses and maybe not more than that. So that's the general consensus. Uh, may, I, may I ask a question? Yes, sure, sure, Dr. Rani. So did you have um, uh, any cases of uh, unresectable um, uh, giant cell tumor treated with uh, long-term uh, uh, therapy who had a uh, stress fractures? Ah, oh, stress fracture, yes. Uh, yes. And so how that... did you treat these patients? No, but, uh, with, even with patients with long-term therapy, we have not had stress fractures. We have, not, uh, we have just had one case of osteonecrosis, maybe. Stress fractures, we have no experience. One of the viewers also wanted to know if stress fracture is common in denosumab, like it is with zolendronic acid, or should there be a holiday after two years or three years? Dr. Wong? Well, that, that's why in my last slide, uh... I think uh, because of all this uh, denosumab and also uh, for uh, Sovita, they are actually uh, modulating the uh, bone resorption. So from, uh, from the experience of osteoporosis, there's uh, some tests to monitor the bone resorption. So whether we can apply a, a similar measurement of the bone resorption that indirectly reflect the activity of the tumors you are treating is one of the area we can explore. So maybe different patient we will have a different type, a different extent or, or the interval or for extent of the of the bone resorption in respond to these drugs. So whether we can have some tests, we can uh, monitor this uh, drug resorption. Let's say the drug resorption uh, stop, and then uh, we, we we can uh, uh, using this data to to adjust the interval or intensity of the dose. So, so hopefully to decrease uh, uh, toxicity in terms of the long term of this kind of drugs for those kind of unresectable tumors. So definitely is one of the area we can explore for, for this. Instead of just giving a rent, uh, a regularly for every patient with same duration or intensity, I think different tumors, the volume of the tumor, the area of the tumor and the re how responsive to the drug is different. So whether we have a, a, some objective measurement of this bone resorption of these drugs, on this uh, tumor uh, 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 destroying the bone we, is definitely one of the area we can explore for that. Instead of just a uh, give regularly for the every patient for this kind of dose to minimize the complication. True. Yes, uh, we have one more question on similar grounds. It's by Dr. Sriman from Bangalore. Uh, he wants to know that uh, apart from the clinical aspect, he wants to know if there's a role of 60 milligram of uh, denosumab. We all have agreed that we have reduced the number of doses. So can we also reduce the dose itself? Because in osteoporosis schedule, it's 60 milligram once in six months. So you think that there is a, there is a role of uh, reducing the dose as well to so minimize the complications. Instead of 120 milligram, can we give a 60 milligram? 60. Next question, because we have to think, I mean, of course, nobody has, uh, I'm sure nobody has yeah. it out. Yes. Yeah. Probably that's the thing to Hop on. Well, Pramod, you and I both know that India is a great country and 
you know we we came to know that lesser doses are effective because they just couldn't afford any more afford <laughs> exactly and we realized that the lesser dose is also effective and maybe the same way we will realize that if the 60 mg is cheaper than 120 i'm sure over a period of time we'll have two groups of patients those treated with 60 and 120 and then we'll have the answers <laughs> yeah correct that's yeah right. so there is a rule maybe i i don't know because right now we've not used uh, the 60 mg dose so i don't think any of us uh, would really yeah. know whether that's effect yeah true so, yeah i think this is a good yeah. question and we need an answer so yeah. we need to do research regarding this so i think uh, by uh, end by the take home message of this uh, discussion would be coming out with a protocol at least with the uh, denosumab and uh, giant cell tumor uh of various experience over the last 8 years probably we should come out with a protocol uh, at least uh, combined uh, with isols or probably with all the bodies together uh, mm -hmm. i think uh, that would be uh, i my thought because many of uh, the people are who are uh, not who are not able to get so many cases they started using denosumab as a, uh, as a primary therapy or some uh, you know just as a uh, uh, just for the fun not fun i would say because it works well so just take the nosmab go on taking taking but not many people i would say more than uh, 50% of the giant cell tumors have been treated uh, uh, not so correctly uh, in various probably uh, i think we should come out with a protocol soon what do you say kc and uh, dr manish and everyone as well yes and i i think even this uh, issue of malignant transformation i think the only way to resolve it is by getting everybody's cases together and then having a common uh, analysis for their markers the the genetic mutations etc to know at least try and identify what is it that is causing the malignant transformation and if we can really identify right now we are still not sure whether it is denosumab the culprit or whether it's something else so i think if we can get all the surgeons in the world to contribute their cases and make a common pool of cases and and those can be studied yes then, then we would know yes definitely uh, there was actually a literature review in the end of 2018 a publication had collected 11 cases of malignant transformation with denosumab so end of 2018 it was 11 i'm sure that there are more now and like sir rightly mentioned we need to collect all of them and see the different factors the number of doses the location you know the, and we have to be very sure about the pre denosumab diagnosis like dr arani mentioned Yeah. and uh, maybe genetic tests would would help yeah. us maybe maybe a center like resolvi or dr wong center can can actually collect all these cases i mean we could send anybody who thinks that they've got a malignant transformation we can actually send the blocks we can send the uh, case material the radiology the imaging everything so that it can be relooked at it in a very uniform way to be certain that whether there is a true malignant transformation or whether this is a malignant gct i think before we start uh, coming out with guidelines on that yeah in fact we are building up uh, some sort of a tissue bank for all these um, uh, giant cell tumor bone we 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 culture every patient with the tumor cells so we got a tumor cell cell line and the order our preclinical study is spacing uh, based on that cell line and uh, now now the next generation sequencing they actually is mapping all the genetic makeup of of this tumor cell actually can build up a library some some part like that and then we can uh, definitely correlate with this um, genetic uh, makeup with the clinical outcome to see what should we do for this kind of cases so we still a lot of uh, unknown with this and as open uh, potential for further research also uh, the viewers can uh, put in a lot of questions so uh, i think we have about uh, 300 plus uh, viewers right now uh, from about uh, 25 countries suraj yes sir mm -hmm. 20 28 countries 28 countries so 300 so we will share all the questions amongst the uh, speakers also so that uh, probably you can communicate either through the private channel or however you want it because every question is a unique question because every giant cell tumor is uh, definitely the way we treat is i think with only with uh, the uh, you discuss with a person who has treated definitely you get an answer of how uh, we have to go ahead with that particular case so anything else suraj no uh, no sir so we have had a, a, a very comprehensive uh, discussion with the use of tenozumab for giant cell tumor of the bone uh, we had around totally 330 registrations mm. 
and uh, we have discussed in detail uh, i don't think we have skipped any questions with regards to trisomab in gct so yeah, we have had an excellent session there's one question popped up is there a difference in response of venusmab to abc versus gct is by dr karthik kudupa from manipal is there any difference in response of venusmab to abc versus gct uh would you arani would you like to take that question sorry do, do you have any experience of treating the the uh, abc in the ABC. Den- yeah 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 uh, palmerini published a paper uh you know you have a good response of course you yeah. stop the osteoclast activity so uh, the only problem is that uh, i th- i think that uh, the treatment uh, of uh, abc could not be a resection yes. so <laughs> you need surgery. So, surgery so i think the only you know answer um, that we have uh, is that uh, and the uh, is that uh, you know if you perform a curettage in traditional surgery it's better if you don't use the nasma before so i mean uh, we can treat uh, abc with embolization we can treat within um, uh, injection so we can treat uh, with a biopsy and the thing. <laughs> so i think that uh, um, you know we have other ways to treat uh, abc yeah, there is one more question now popped up by dr shilesh She, he has a 32 year old female with distal forearm with small bilateral lung nodules uh, started on denosumab 2 years back all the lung nodules have been disappeared right now and the local resection local lesion has responded very well but resectable Do, does he have to have a resection is the same question what we discussed right now uh, either to resect it out or not depending upon the morbidity and uh, does he have to remove the lung nodules as well is uh, the answer yes yes manish yes please yeah, so 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 the primary has to be treated in a gct because that's the source and if the lung nodules have gone i think he should just observe because uh, in india no nodules is common it has to be because of tumor we've seen that granulomas infections can cause uh, multiple nodules in the lung at times we just observe them unless they increase in size i don't think we can make an assumption that they are because of disease on that so if if the tumor nodules come back and they they are, you can objectively demonstrate that they are growing in size then we would biopsy it to confirm that they are uh, the same giant cell tumor but the primary has to be treated on its own merit irrespective of whether there was lung meds or not the primary needs to be treated so anything else? so any other any other thoughts any other questions to be discussed dr irani dr kc dr manish you want to stress on something before we wind up the uh, oral session well one thing is that don't use denosumab indiscriminately as we said i think it can be a dangerous thing yeah and and like we've all seen i th- i think it is very important to leave it to the experts to decide whether a patient needs denosumab or not and i think the time is actually coming where we are actually going on and telling even the regular orthopedic surgeons that i think it is best to leave the giant cell tumors to orthopedic onco surgeons because the amount of uh, knowledge and the progress in treatment has uh, is so much that a lot of things have changed compared to what it used to be 20 years ago i mean the way even the curettage is done the way the whole planning is done the decision whether you're going to use denosumab before the curettage whether you're going to use bisphosphonates all these things are going to come into play which a normal a regular orthopedic surgeon who doesn't do too many tumors is probably not going to think of yeah. so i think it's a good idea or a good message to say that you must at least get an opinion from somebody mm-hmm. with experience before you you start deciding to use denosumab for gct perfect perfectly put so let's uh, call it a day suraj yes yes sir thank you all the yes, uh, you the thanking Do- note uh, dr rani dr kc wong dr manish agarwal and dr pramod chinda thank thank you very much for uh, joining us in this comprehensive uh, session of tenosumab in treating the giant cell tumor of the bone and uh, like dr pramod mentioned uh, in case there are any more doubts from the viewer section uh, we'll be happy to uh, reply to them and then uh, answer all their queries after discussing with the experts in private uh, later on
so we would like to have uh, more of such uh, discussions in hot topics in orthopedic oncology and we would also like to have a collaborative uh, clinical uh, research uh, research oriented activities with different uh, institutes like like uh, dr manisha garwal just mentioned uh, which is uh, in need uh, in the present day so thank you once again for joining us and uh, hope to uh, see you soon with uh, further collaborations thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so the, then ubc should be the next topic of discussion because i'm sure there's lots of things to yes talk there as well uh, yes two months are very difficult times here in bangalore that's what we have decided <laughs> yeah. so i think all of us i think we let's uh, take that opportunity of corona covid and yeah let's, okay yeah yeah so yes. i so yeah, all of you keep safe and uh, all okay. the viewers also thanks for coming live and uh, definitely it was uh, very nice uh, to see you all at least in this way keep keep yourself safe thanks arani and uh, say hi yeah. to everybody yeah and congratulations you. Huh? very successful meeting very really enjoyed yeah. so yeah. Uh, looking Same forward here. to the second similar meeting in the future yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you thank, thank you. you thank you so much yeah. for coordinating it well yeah. thank you okay. sir thank you sir my okay. pleasure my pleasure okay thank you bye 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 thank you for the invitation See you soon. Ciao, ciao. So ciao. Ciao. Arrivederci. <laughs>